scriptures. It's a spiritual truth. So let's go ahead and look at chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, During that night the king could not sleep, so he gave an order to bring the book of records, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. So he has that party. They're going to have the party the next day. But that night, the king can't sleep. And, and I do this. When I can't sleep, I, I wake up and I read myself back to sleep. Right? And the, the problem is, before you had iPads to read by, you know, you'd have to turn on the light, read, and then you'd fall asleep with the light on, and eventually it'd wake you back up, right? But now your iPad just turns off. <laughs> you know? So I, I do this. When I can't sleep, I'll go ahead and read. And nothing better than a book of records, a history book to read to put you back to sleep, right? <laughs> and so that's what he calls for. Now, verse 2 goes on, it says, And it was found written that Mordecai had reported concerning Bethana and uh, Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who were doorkeepers, that they had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? Then the king's servants who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. Now we saw in a previous chapter that Mordecai, working in the government, had overheard this plot to, to take down the king. And he reported it, and the king uh, took these men out, and it was true, so he took these men out. And that was recorded, but the king never rewarded Mordecai. So you see a lot of providence taking place here, right? The king can't sleep. He happens to call for the history books, and he happens to open the history books right to the place where it was recorded that Mordecai had saved the king's life. How cool is that? And so he realizes that he hasn't rewarded this man. Now, we may never see, personally, the righteous exalted and the, the proud brought to humility on this side of heaven. We don't always get to see that. But the thing is, if God is a perfect judge, then it will happen, won't it? If he is a perfect judge, right? And um, this isn't going... There, you, oop, there we go. So Revelation 13, 10, it, say, 10, it says, He who leads in ca into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, why did I bring up that verse? So in Revelation, this is a place where a bunch of martyrs had just been killed. But they know that God is just. And therefore, they don't have to enact justice themselves. They can just wait and be patient, right? And so for us, that is the thing. We don't always have to be angst and angry at everybody. They're going to get their due. And when you really think about it, it's like, oh my gosh, I hope they repent because they're going to get their due, <laughs> right? And it's a scary thing to fall into the hands of a living, righteous God, right? And so we don't always see it this side of heaven, but woe to them that don't, uh, that don't receive forgiveness because they will receive those things that they've done in the flesh. Now, it's going to be amazing when we are rewarded in heaven. You see, all our bad things have been wiped out. The only thing left to judge us on are the good things we've done. And we're going to be amazed because even ourselves who, who want to build ourselves up and are so prideful, we even forget good things that we've done. But God is a perfect judge, right? So he doesn't forget the good things we've done. And that's a really cool thing. But if you're bad, you tend to forget or push away the bad things you've done as well. <laughs> so, there, so God has a perfect record, you know, of, of the wrongs that people have done unless they've been wiped out, unless they've been torched in heaven through the forgiveness of sins. And so this is our patience. Now, the king wants to deal with this. And so he says in verse 4, who is in the court? Who, who's around? What, what officials around? The, who's, who can serve me here? Now, Haman just entered the outer court of the king's palace in order to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows which he had prepared for him. Remember, 
Mordecai himself, he was the one specifically who had caused all this angst in this man's life. And so when he told his friends about it, they go, oh, build a gallows. And what a gallows was, was a, just a stick, and they would impale him so everybody could see it. He'd just be shish high in the air as he passed away in agony in front of the people. And this was his plan specifically for Mordecai. Now, everybody else was going to be killed because they were related to him as Jews, right? And um, so he wanted to, to do this to Mordecai. And he was going to the king to ask the king's permission to specifically do that. And the king was looking to reward this very man. And so the king's servant said to him, Behold, Haman is standing in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honor? And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king desire to honor more than me? Then Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king desires to honor, let him bring a royal robe, which the king has worn, and the horse on which the king is ridden, and on whose head a royal crown has been placed. And let the robe and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble princes, and let them array the man whom the king desires to honor, and let him lead him on horseback through the city square, and proclaim before him, Thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Take quickly the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so for Mordecai the Jew, who is sitting at the king's gate. Do not fall short in anything of all that you have said. Whoa. This is one of the greatest stories. So pridefully, presumptuously, and stupidly, he sticks his foot right in his mouth. But again, remember, the previous evening, Haman had went to his house and was gloating over his accomplishments, gloating over the king's love for him. And he thought, man, I'm at the pinnacle. I'm at the top. And he's he's telling this to his family, anyone who will hear. But he's an evil man. And people can be so deceived. They can be on this collision course with God, but deceiving themselves. So he has this blind pride. Whom would the king desire to honor more than me? And sometimes we can think that should be me. And there's a story, you know, that tells us in the New Testament that we're to take the lower seat instead of always pushing ourselves to the front. And if you keep that story in your heart, you'll watch it happen. You'll watch it work out in life, even in your own life. You know, in airports when everybody's all frustrated and busy and pushing forward. And they're angry. One time coming back from Brazil, this lady pushes in front of me, her face is all red, and she's just mad. She's elbowing all of us, and we're just tired going, whatever. So we get to the front. They go, oh, we're out of seats. We only have seats in first class. Now, we're in Brazil, right? It's a nine, ten-hour flight back to the States. We got first class all the way back. And so they load us on the plane first, and they give us drinks and some food. And I see this lady carrying all her luggage. She's all huffing and puffing. She's going back to economy. It was so good. <laughs> you know, and I just go, bang, you know, it came to my mind. That the Lord does this. You know, and just so many, so many times you see this happen. Blind pride. Whom would the king desire to honor more than me? Verse 11, so Haman took the robe and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed to you for him, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honor. I don't know what Mordecai is thinking, but we'll be able to ask him in heaven. But just such sweet justice, right? Because Mordecai knows what happened. 
He knows this man hates him. This, he knows this man is the man responsible. He knows he wouldn't bow to this man, and this man is just honoring the man that wouldn't bow to him. But Haman hurried home mourning with his head covered. You know, it's, it's amazing what God does when we don't seek to take the highest seat or the highest place, when we don't grasp for it. You know, going to conferences over the years. You know, you go to this conference and there's a thousand pastors there and some of them have huge churches and they're famous and they've written books and, you know, people want to rub elbows with them. And what I would do when I'd go into the, the dining hall, I would walk to the very back and I would find a table full of guys that I didn't know. And I'm not friends with these big shots anymore. I, I knew a lot of them at one time. But I'm friends with those guys still today that I went to the back with and got out to meet over a meal 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 12 years ago. And I've gotten the most awesome conversations when I've gone to a meal with a bunch of people at a conference or whatever it might be. And, you know, I, I'm... Every time that happens, I'm just reminded, thank you, Lord. Thank you. It's so funny because sometimes if I end up sitting at a table with big wigs, I'm just all quiet. <laughs> I don't know what to say and I feel out of place. So verse 13, Haman recounted to Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish origin, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. Thanks, honey. <laughs> you know, curse God and die there, you know. But they see what's happening. It's almost that it's prophetic. The Lord was exalting Mordecai, even though, even through all of Haman's efforts. And understand that. The Lord lifts up and the Lord puts down. So often we, we want to trust in flesh, but the Lord will do this. And sometimes it takes years. Now, before we came. Uh, before I came this evening, I'd been, I was on my phone texting with, with Hannah Overton, right? How long did it take for us to figure that one out? Eight and a half years. And we kept on saying, Lord, when are you going to stand up? And the Lord finally stood up. Certainly not in our timing, but in his. But man, he definitely stood up in that one. And those who were seeking your destruction, so many of them found themselves destroyed in their careers. But also understand that God goes before us. Remember, the Israelites, when they had left Egypt, everywhere they went, people were afraid of them. God had made sure that they'd heard the stories about the plagues and how Pharaoh's army had been wiped out by these people. What are they? A ragtag group of former slaves. They knew how to make brick, and that was about it, right? But God went before them and put fear into the hearts of those that were before them. And so when they conquered people, God had gone before Haman's wife and friends had heard of the Jews and the miraculous victories and the stories that the, when the Lord had given them victory in battle. They knew the stories about Egypt and slavery and the Red Sea and so on and so forth. And they're going, they're Jewish, man. I think we're in trouble. This is too weird. Verse 14, while they were still talking with him, the king arrived and hastily brought Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. She went to the king's presence, asked for a banquet, 
Next day at the banquet, she asked for another banquet. This is the, the last banquet, right? He is so distraught, he's late for this banquet, so much so that the king has to send servants to come and get Haman. Chapter 7, verse 1, Now the king and Haman came to drink wine with Esther, the queen. And the king said to Esther on the second day also, as they drank their wine at the banquet, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you, and what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom it shall be done. Now he's repeated, this is the third time he's repeated this. Many say, well, why was Esther, he, she kept on putting off that final request. But I think what is happening is the Lord is solidifying it in the king's heart and preparing the king so that she can bring her request. That timing is very important. Verse 3, then Queen Esther replied, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given to me as my petition and my people as my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed and to be killed and to be annihilated. Now, if we had only been sold as slaves, men and women, I would have remained silent, for the trouble would not, be, not commensurate with the annoyance to the king. And so she says, since our life, not just slavery or something like that, but since our life is at stake, this is why I approach you, king. I, I respect you that much. So what happens here is she is innocent and wise. She's innocent. She's telling the truth, right? So we need to learn from Esther to wait upon the Lord. There's a time for us to speak, and there's also a time for us to be silent. And so often we just run our mouths without thinking, don't we? Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Man, that one verse, if we could just live it, the world would be such a better place, wouldn't it? But we need to be wise. In Matthew 10, 16, the Lord knows what we're facing. It's, it's, a, it's a wild world out there. He says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. It's interesting what we want to do with our authority when you gain authority in the world, isn't it? So often we want to show our authority or we want to exert our power, right? Because that's how everybody else does it. I'm in a, a group of pastors, and, and we do approach political figures. And uh, every so often, they get all caught up in the, oh, yeah, and we can do this, and no, 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 you know. And, and in all reality, a few phone calls, and we could have five or 6,000 people on our side, right, with the pastor's connection, maybe even more, maybe 50,000, who knows, right? And the politicians know this. But I always tell them, mm -mm -mm, that's not how we roll. That's not how we do it. We, we do not work as the world wor works. How are we supposed to approach people? At one time, we were going to uh, approach a, a female public official. And this man's like, well, she stepped into the public realm. We need to, you know, intimidate her. And I looked at the man, and I go, no, that's how the world does it. See, the world says there's no difference between a man and a woman, but we know it's different, and men are supposed to treat women in, in, a, in a gentle way, in a respectful way, to her femininity. And I'm not going to break God's rule to exert pressure like that, right? So, so many think, well, how's the church going to do this? How, how does the church get anywhere? How does the church survive? Well, did Rome force Rome on everybody? And where is the Roman Empire today? But where's the church today? Right, you know, so so we need to do things by God's principles. And there is power in that. There's radical power in that. And again, notice her wording: to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Now, the interesting thing about this is she is telling the king, who is officially her husband, she is telling him exactly what he had signed into law. 
So now the king's realizing, I've been snookered. I've been manipulated. I've been lied to. Right? So she uses his words. She's not just trying to elaborate just to get a fact, to get a rise of the king. She's using his own words with him. And she also says that people have been sold. Remember the deal between Haman and the king. I'm going to pay for it all because I'm going to pillage all their stuff, and I'm going to be rich, and I'll give you a certain amount of it. Now, some see an interesting analogy in the story of Esther, and I'll say maybe, maybe not, but I like it. I like seeing the analogy of the gospel in the Old Testament, in the Old Testimony, Testament. <laughs> So as the Jews were, all of us as human beings are under sentence of death. Why? The wages of sin is death, right? So we're in trouble and are scheduled to die. We have an accuser that wants us dead. And it is only one special person who sits upon the throne of glory who can pardon our death sentence and spare our life. What do we need? We need to be related to somebody that can go before the king and plead for our forgiveness, as it were. And so you have the gospel message here. Now, it is amazing. You know, a lot of people would say, well, Esther, she didn't really her. She was a queen. Well, again, she hadn't been called on for a month. Her husband was in the habit of having these beauty pageants and getting his hair full. <laughs> no, so. And she was willing to do that. She was willing to at least risk her life in order to save her people, right? And Jesus gave his life. You know, for us, sometimes we don't really sacrifice much when it comes to our faith. And I love hearing stories of faith. And then I realize, oh, it is, it is so worth it. The Moravians were a sect of Christianity, and they got very into missions. In the 19th century. Slavery was huge in the Caribbean. But the owner of this particular island was a British owner, and he had a very atheist manager over the island. And what was happening, and this happened in America also, that those that were under slavery had grasped the freedom of Christianity. And it swept through. But this particular island uh the manager of this particular island under this particular owner just decided that's not what he wanted for his slaves and so he kept every bible every missionary everybody out as an atheist and so the three thousand slaves that were on that island he wanted to do to live and die without hearing of christ But two young Germans, Morvarians, who were very strong in their mission desires and push, they were in their 20s, and they'd heard about the island, and they thought, how would we get there? Well, they ended up selling themselves as slaves to the owner who sent them the island for the manager to have to use. And their community and their family and extended family came to see them off when it was time for them to leave. They would never come back. They were sold into slavery. They were weeping. Was this necessary? Was it why? What are you doing with your life? And as a ship moves off and they're on their way, no turning back, these two young men linked their arms together 
And they said, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. And so what they're doing is they're looking, they're looking at their lives. And they're looking at what Christ had done for them. And they're thinking, what we're doing isn't near what Christ did for us. And, and, and they're saying, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. He's done so much for us. Aren't we giving all to him? And that was their attitude. And this became the call of more varying missions. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. And the Bible says, for God so loved the world. That, I understand that to mean the world as the sinful lost world. For God so loved the world. And why do I think that's a sin of lost world? Because he had to give something for it. It wasn't the world that was good enough to go to heaven. It was the lost world that needed something given, the blood of Christ. And so, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his son for the world. That whoever would receive that gift would be saved. Whoever. It's open. It's called the communal view of salvation. God died for the sin of the world, and it only becomes effective for those that receive it. So here's the thing. Every time that someone gives their heart to the Lord, more of the blood of Christ is becoming uh, effective. And we should rejoice in that. The angels rejoice. More of the sacrifice of God is taken advantage of every time that someone gives their heart to the Lord. Verse 5 goes on, it says, When King Ahasuerus called Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he who presumed to do thus? And Esther said, A foe and an enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman became terrified before the king and queen. Bam! This man is now quaking. He's been found out. The king arose in his anger from drinking wine and went into the palace garden. He is so flustered. He is so frustrated. He's been taken advantage of. He is angry. He takes a walk. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm had been determined against him by the king. Now when the king returned from the palace garden into the place where they were drinking wine, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. So he stumbles forward as he's begging her, and he ends up falling on top of her as the king walks back. And oh, God is so good. Then the king said, Will he even assault the queen with me in my house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs who were before the king, said, Hold, indeed, the gallows standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on behalf of the king. And the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows, which he had prepared for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. So from bad to worse, right? Proverbs 28.10. Whoever causes the upright to go astray in an evil way, he himself will fall into his own pit, but the blameless will inherit good. They get trapped in their own trap. Now, I do want you to notice in this story that the, immediately Haman's... So Haman was second in command, right? Immediately when Haman's aides see Haman's error, what do they do? They turn on him, right? All right, king, he's going down. What do you want us to do? We'll hang him. Right? And uh, Haman, 
Haman did not lead, or Haman did not command authority. He demanded it, didn't he? Or uh, obedience. He didn't command it. People didn't want to serve this man. And so as soon as they saw he was out, they just turned on him. There's a different character in the scriptures. Remember, King Saul had a son. And his son was a noble man. And Saul was going to put his own son to death. But there's no way he could do it. Why? Because he was a very, very good man. Right? And there's a principle in the, in the New Testament. It says, Judge not, lest ye be judged in, in the same manner in which you judge. And it's, and it's saying, don't bring condemnation down on people, one that's not your place, but don't judge in a sinful way towards people either, just bringing up judgment. Because obviously, we all make judgments all the time, right? We make assessments all the time. How do you pick elders without making judgments? But you're using godly judgments. You're not using worldly, civil assessments and judgments. You know, Paul tells the people, note among you those that are mature and follow in their ways. Follow me as I follow Christ. All kinds of judgments are made, right? But if you judge harshly, you're going to be judged harshly. If you judge in a sinful manner, people are going to treat you in the same way. And this is exactly what happened to Haman. He was harsh and dismissive of all those around him. He wasn't appreciative. In God's eyes, who matters more? The king or the trash collector? Yeah. Well, one, they're, they're both equally bound to hell without Jesus, right? <laughs> I mean, they're both equally sinners, ultimately. But God loves them. He created them in his image. He's not a richter of man, right? You know how easy this world is right now? We got so many people that think they're just awesome, right? Right? I'm awesome because of the color of my skin. Isn't that the most stupid statement you could ever imagine? And it's antithetical to what, you know, the uh, uh, Martin Luther King said. We're, we're, we're looking for a time when people are not judged by the color of their skin, you know, but by their character, right? And this world has just gone mad and, and divisive and, and crazy and the answer to racism isn't more racism. And, and, and you have just this dismissive. And it is amazing when you take time and you talk to human beings around you and you treat them like human beings, you are so blessed with all kinds of amazing stories. Instead of just writing people off like they don't matter. But everybody matters. But you see this, and Haman, you see his character, his wife, his family. Yeah, you're going to die, Haman. And now these servants, yeah, I'll throw them up there myself. It's wild. The Lord rewards the wicked in perfect accord with their wickedness. If not here, they're going to be judged there. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed or repaid for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or evil. And the cool thing is, when we're judged, there's only good left because the bad's been taken away. So be careful if you find yourself trying to dig a pit for someone to fall into. And even as believers, we can do this. We can play, play the game. We can, we can want to get back at people and be careful of that. People at work or whatever it might be. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil 
with good. The best revenge on someone who's trying to hurt you is to be the one who does the right thing. Do good, not evil, and let God take care of the rest. I sit on a lot of, uh, a lot of church boards, and um, it's a busy time of the year for me right now because we all have end-of-the-year board meetings. <laughs> I haven't had mine yet, uh, but board of trustees is what we call them. And, and, um, so I sit on these boards, and they have their elders in the church and everything, but it's good to have outside pastors kind of overseeing so you don't get kind of stuck in your head and, and not see the whole picture. <laughs> And uh, so I sit on a lot of these boards, and, and over the years, um, it's probably been about 10 years that I sit on a lot of boards, uh, six or eight, I don't know. Uh, inevitably, something happens with an employee. They kind of go south, they turn, and they do something really mean, right? Right? And then, man, I just got to fire him. So they call me up. I'm just, you know, sometimes, oh, some guys are, they're not like that at all. But some are like, yeah, we just got to get him, you know. And I look at him and I go, no, you need to give him a bigger severance than you even planned on giving him. And I go, I go, one, it's just money. Money is a tool in God's hands, but you need to be above board. Even though they may have wronged you, this verse still applies. Right? I have a good friend, Lance. Lance always reminds me of that. You always go above and beyond in godliness. You live by that principle. You know, I, you know, I get advice that it's good practical advice sometimes, but I go, yeah, it's business advice. That's not spiritual advice. But I think... I just, I just think about how God has blessed us, and I think we are not. I mean, some, I have great support around me, but I'm not good at all this stuff. But God takes care of us. Because before we even moved out here, the guy that moved out here with me to, to help plant the church, and we're still friends today, we prayed as, as much as we can, we want to just do it God's way, no matter what it costs no matter what it costs, we want to do it God's way. And things got crazy, and then we, we, we regroup and get back there to the right place. You know, and we look at things, ah, that ain't right, let's change it. Oh, but, you know, and it's like things sneak in, and you got to get rid of them. It's just living by those principles. And it puts you in that place where God can bless you. And so someone is a jerk and they, they do something wrong and whatever. One, I'm always trying to not think they're as evil as looks there, right? Because love believes all things and love hopes all things. I know a lot of people that do dumb things. And a lot of it goes back to the way they were raised or some trauma in their life or something else and, and they don't even realize they're, they're doing it or they've convinced themselves or they've been manipulated by someone else. And I just want to believe that. And I want to try to hope all things until I know absolutely different. I don't want to believe gossip until I absolutely know something's different, right? Right? So there's a lot of principles in the scriptures. And, and what you're doing is you're putting yourself in the place where God can bless you. But you're dumb and you're going to be taken advantage of. I'd rather be dumb and following the principles of God than being wise in my own eyes and doing it my own way. You see what I'm saying? And when God says be generous and you'll never outgive me, then we try to be generous and we, don't, we can't outgive God. Right? And, uh, you know, so this is something really, tr and don't do it 100%, but we try to live by these principles as much as we possibly can, and we catch ourselves going off, we try to get back to it, you know, and that's just important. Repay no one evil for evil. Don't dig a pit for someone because they've dug a pit for you. 
Just wait around. They'll eventually fall into their own pit. <laughs> Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we thank you. Um, man, this story is just fun to read no matter what. Because, Lord, we can just see your fingerprint over one or two things can be coincidence, Lord. Not the amount of things that just came to be. We, we see your fingerprints all over it, God. Lord, during this crazy time, during this dark time, Lord, we have to trust in your providence. Lord, you're a living God. You are active in the world today. And even as we spent a few weeks just looking at things of the Holy Spirit, may it be that we're surrendered and guided, led and used by the Holy Spirit in this world. Lord, we want to be a part of these plans, these unique things where people can say coincidence, but we know better. We say providence, God. And we love you, Lord, and just uh, ask that you bless this group here tonight. Lord, bless our outreach coming up as well. And we also pray that Christmas time would be sweet, that it would be about you this year, God. We know people are ready to celebrate. There's more lights out this year than in the past years, God. And may it be that you're glorified in this season, we pray. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand up.